everybody, and welcome to everybody's favorite youth baseball podcast, Clearing the Bases, featuring Coach Jimmy Phil and Jerry. I'm David Friedman, and I want to thank you for coming along on this ride with us. How are we doing today, Coach? Doing good, Dave. Just got back from Florida a couple of days ago, and boy, am I not happy to be home. <laughs> what? Uh, when you? When you get actually get back? Got back late Wednesday night. Your, your scouting trip to Florida, you're looking at uh, grabbing some new players for your program up here. You want to know something? What killed me is I was dying to go look at a baseball game anywhere. I didn't care if it was, you know, a bunch of 10 year olds playing a pickup game in a sandlot. I couldn't find a baseball game down there for the life of me. There were no, the area I was in, there were no colleges around. There were no college games, no high school games. I was dying yeah, well, uh, I'm sure your I'm sure your wife appreciated getting a couple of days of break there. <laughs> yeah, she was happy. Yeah, so that's good, good stuff. So, all right, so um, on today's show, we are very pleased to have with us a very special guest, Mr. Jeff Fry. He's a former big league player, spent about eight seasons in the in the bigs. Um, he played for a number of different teams, uh, drafted by the Rangers, also played with the Red Sox, Rockies, and Blue Jays. So uh, this is a treat for all of our listeners, and I want to welcome to the show, Jeff. Thanks for coming out. Yeah, thank you, David. Thanks for having me, and thank you, Jimmy. Thanks for coming. We really appreciate it, Jeff. Yeah, so we're going to get into a bunch of different topics today um, that uh, I know that you have a a, a quite a big presence on social media talking about uh, training youth players and all that. And obviously that's what our focus is here. So uh, before we get into that, you want to talk a little bit about your, how your love for baseball started and how your journey down this path started up with. Yeah. Well, I, when I was a little boy growing up in uh, California, the Bay area, um, my family was big into really into softball, but they loved all sports. And, and um, you know, my uncle Peter was very influential in, in putting a baseball bat in my hand. And, uh, you know, it was just every day, it seemed like it was another sporting event, whether I was playing football out in the yard with my, with my neighbor, neighborhood kids or basketball in the backyard with my cousin or wiffle ball out in the street. It was always some type of sporting event. And, and baseball was just uh, something I fell in love with. And, you know, I was fortunate enough to get to play it for as a professional for a while. And, uh, you know, I've just always loved baseball. It's always been my favorite sport. I don't remember where it was. It might have been a show that you were on and I heard you say, but you were a high school and college basketball player. Is that yeah. right? Yeah, I was taller back then. But uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> it's a real funny story is uh, – when I was in ninth grade, you know, I played basketball at St. John's Catholic School in San Leandro, California, is, um, from fifth grade to eighth grade. And when I first went to that school, I wasn't a very good basketball player. And I was like the last kid that got picked at recess. Um, by the time my seventh and eighth grade, I was the starting point guard. But I was real little. And uh, I really wasn't a very good shooter. I could really handle the ball and you know, played decent defense. And so in my freshman year, I had to go, you know, to a different school. So I went to Bishop O'Dowd High School in Oakland, California, and I went out for basketball. And this is like a 4A Catholic high school, kind of a powerhouse in California. And I didn't, you know, I'd never been cut. And so I went out for the basketball team and, and coach Mike Phelps put his arm around me and said, son, he said, come back when you grow up. And I got cut. I was like, man, I've never been cut. It kind of hurt, you know, and and uh, I never forgot that. So a few years later, I moved to uh, to Oklahoma as a junior in high school and went out for basketball and made the team and ended up leading the team and scoring like 18 points a game my junior year but before the three point line. And then the next year, my senior year, I averaged 23 and a half points a game at 5'5", 135 pounds, <laughs> and was offered a, a basketball scholarship at Eastern Oklahoma College. And I was going to walk on in baseball. And that summer, playing sp for Spyro American Legion over a two-day period, I got 15 hits in a row and went wow. out and out. And so the Mark Pollard from Carl Albert Junior College asked me if I wanted to come to Carl Albert and play baseball and basketball. 
And so I thought that was a better opportunity. I went out for basketball. I made it all the way through the first scrimmage. I got in for about 45 seconds and I got one shot and almost broke the backboard. I was so nervous. And I was like, man, I'm going to stick with baseball. <laughs> I just didn't see much future in basketball. I was going to be the, the guy who came in in the last minute and shot free throws maybe. And I was like, man, I think I'm just going to focus on baseball. And that's what I did. So, so you're, you went to the junior college route. I right? didn't get, yeah, I didn't get recruited by anybody else. Honestly, that was the only opportunity I had. I think I got maybe a couple letters from out-of-state schools, like in Louisiana and stuff, in Kansas, but no D1 offers or anything like that out of high school. Wow, that's interesting, because I'm a big uh, believer that JUCO is, is the way to go for a lot of youth baseball players, and you know how it is in this climate, you know, and I believe it's, it's pretty much driven by the parents most of the time. You know, they're D1 or bust, and, you know, they don't even want to look at D3, let alone junior college. But I'm a big promoter of going to junior. I mean, you know, you're living proof. Go to junior college, you know, uh, get your reps in there, you know, get your experience there. And believe me, if you're good enough, people are going to find you. Yeah, D1 is, I agree with you 100% because, you know, you see these kids committing in eighth and ninth grade to D1s, this verbal commitments that mean absolutely nothing. And it's on their social media and their parents are bragging about it to their friends. And, and it's like, well, you know, your son is not going to play for two years. He's going to get red shirted. And then he's going to probably, you know, sit on the bench the next year, play a little, unless he's just a stud. And then, uh, you know, why not go to JUCO and play? If you play, you have a chance of getting better. And so that's right. what worked for me. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the age old thing to me. We talk about it on the show quite a bit. It's, it's, you know, do you want to be the 12th player on this, you know, high level team, or do you want to be the sixth, play, you know, sixth best player on a lower level team where you're going to get reps to get better? Cause you only get better by getting reps. And it's the same thing with to me where coaches are making decisions between should a player be on JV or varsity, if it's, you know, that ninth or 10th grader, and, you know, to me, I'm, I'm always defaulting on unless he's a bona fide starter, you keep him down until you need until you need him, because that's where you're going to get your reps. You know, what's I don't know. I've, I've seen so many examples of the opposite of that through the years. And, and you just you, you crush these kids spirits. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, you know, for me, I, I went in not like highly touted or anything. Um, they had a returning second baseman that, you know, the first part of the year we had to we played double hitters every day. So the first, you know, I'd start one game and he'd start the next. Right. And after a couple of weeks, coach uh, decided that I would start both games and um, ended up doing, you know, hit three thirty something, I think my freshman year. And um, wow. really didn't, you know, I didn't think it was, any, I was doing anything special. I was just playing baseball. I was getting a free education to play baseball and make some new friends. And, you know, I felt, I was fortunate, I thought. And then my sophomore year, I had a great season. I hit like 430. And wow. my, my coach called me in his office. This is a true story. Coach called me in his office and said, I think you're a year away. And I said, from what, coach? And he goes, from getting drafted. And I said, by the Army? <laughs> and he goes, no, you idiot. My <laughs> professional baseball. And I said, you're crazy. I was like, I'd never even thought I could be even close to good enough to do that. So that's, and that's, and that's the, that's the real situation. You weren't, you didn't have the stars in your eyes at, at that age of like, you know, I, I know what my path is, should be, or, you know, that, that type of thing. No idea. I, I lived in Eastern Oklahoma, a town called Panama, 2000 people, class 2A. And, um, the Tulsa Drillers were the double-A affiliate for the Texas Rangers. They're about 100 miles from us. And then Oklahoma City was the triple-A affiliate, um, about three hours from us. And I didn't even know those teams existed when I was right. in high school. Wow. wow. You know, That's I awesome. To go to JUCO tournament, and I have a great tournament, and nobody, nobody called me. The, before the tournament coach goes – you know, I want all these schools are calling about Fry, you know, Texas, OU, Arkansas. He goes, but I want them to go to Miami or Florida State or Cal State Fullerton. Those were the big dogs back in the late or the mid 80s, late 80s, you know. And I'm like, right. yeah, coach, it sounds great. And I go to Juco tournament and I go seven for 11 in three games. Wow. Right. Nice. Against some great competition and nobody called. 
And I was like, what the heck am I doing wrong? And, and then I found out that this, they said that I was too slow, knock kneed and duck footed, they called me. And I was, you know, I got kind of ticked. And so nobody called and except Southeastern Oklahoma State where my coach had played, which is NAI school in Durant, Oklahoma, great NAI, one of the top in the country. But I, you know, I didn't want to go to NAI school. I wanted to go D1. Coach just, you know, he got me all excited. About you up. And then sure enough, I ended up going with my tail tucked between my legs to Southeastern. And after a week, Coach Matheny called me in his office and I'm going to imitate his voice. I mean, I love this man, but he goes, Fry, I know you don't want to be here, but quit pouting and get after it. And I'm like, all right, coach. So that's what I did. And, you know, I hit 380, not 388, I think, my junior year, and then 452 my senior year and set the school record in hitting first team All-American. And still nobody called, <laughs> no scouts. Jeez. or Never talked to a professional scout in my life. One time I ran a 60 uh, against one of our, our – Benny Calvert was our stud outfielder. We knew he was getting drafted. And so the Red Scout came to Arkansas to time Benny in the 60 on turf. And uh, Coach Matheny goes, Fry, go run with Benny. Because we all knew Benny could fly. I mean, dude was still in like 40 bases in college and hitting 24 homers. And man, it dude wow. was and so I ran the 60 against Benny and I beat him. Oh boy. And, wow. And I didn't even know I could beat him. Uh, and I ran a six six and the scout's like, man, I didn't know you could run like that. And I was like, I didn't either. <laughs> you know, I just knew I wanted to beat Benny. Uh, and so that, you know, I got, uh, Benny got invited to a, a Texas Rangers tryout camp and he didn't want to go because he knew he was going to get drafted by the Reds. So I took his invitation, went in his place and um, had a great day. And that's how I ended up getting drafted. That's awesome. That's awesome. And, and it was one of the things I was excited to talk to you about, um, again, with our show being catered towards the, the youth player is you certainly were not prototypical size. You know, you didn't, you didn't fully mention that, but you know, you talked about that the, they, they made comments about your, your running style and, and being too slow, but just talk a little bit about what you had to overcome just from the, just from a size standpoint. Yeah, well, when I graduated high school, I was 5'5", 135, and then um, when I graduated from college, I finished my four years, I was like 5'9", 165. That's a big, as big as I could get. And, you know, I was always, obviously, the, you know, one of the smaller guys on the team, but uh, I didn't really, I kind of used that as motivation because, you know, there was nothing I could do about it. I just had to... <laughs> you know, go out there with what God gave me. And, and, you know, it's my parents' fault. I'm only five, nine. It's not my fault. And, you know, you can't do much about your, the size, you know, I could get stronger, but I can't get taller. And, um, yeah. you know, I just use that, uh, you know, because people my whole life told me I was too small to do things. And you know, every time they told me, I was like, okay, what well, does it matter how my size, if I can hit, you know, if I can hit the ball better than the six foot three guy, who cares how tall I am? Right. And that's really what it is, right? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. And that was, I mean, even when I played professional, I was one of the smallest guys. Had a coach in A ball ask me if I ever considered using steroids. And oh, I geez. said, you know, I didn't even, this was in 1989 in Gastonia. And I said, no. Like, why? He goes, because I don't think you'll ever be big enough to play in the major leagues. And I said, well, if I'm not big enough, I'm not big enough, but I'm not doing steroids. I don't know what it's going to, the side effects to that. And plus it's against the rules. So I'm not doing it. <laughs> right. I, I mean, the last I knew, I don't think steroids made you grow tall. No, no. I mean, I guess it might've made me stronger or whatever. Right. Who knows? The... So let's, let's move on a little bit and talk about hitting. Okay. So I know that, you know, you were a couple ticks under 300 lifetime hitter, which, says a lot so to me what better person to talk to about hitting and kind of like what's going on with the climate of hitting now because you know obviously I'm a little bit older so I have an old school we'll call it way of approaching hitting where a lot of the younger guys that are teaching now 
are teaching a totally different thing than I do. So I just want to get your your thoughts on on hitting. Yeah, a lot of the young guys that are teaching hitting now that weren't good hitters. I mean, that's what I see a lot of the instruction on uh, you know social media is that uh, now we're trying to teach everybody to hit this one way, to lift the ball, to hit the ball in the air because you got to hit extra base hits because getting on first base isn't important anymore. You know, right. and I think it's nonsense. And, and especially uh, some of the, you know, using the, the great players as the example, right? Let's train everybody to hit like the greatest players in the game. Well, the greatest players in the game like Ken Griffey Jr. Uh, could walk out of the dugout, not stretch, and get in the cage and the first swing hit it in the third deck. And we just marvel at this guy and so many of the superstars of the game that could do things that the rest of us couldn't do. And, and why do I want to try and swing like Nomar when I can't hit like Nomar? You know, right. Nomar, has, Nomar has a gift that I don't have. And I realize that. And so I think so much of what you see now is people trying to teach young kids, seven, eight, nine, 10 year olds to swing like Barry Bonds or to swing like, you know, Miguel Cabrera or Juan Soto or Mike Trout. And those guys developed those, their swings from the time they were seven or eight years old, all the way up to when they made the big leagues. And it's their own unique swing. It's unique to them. And, you know, they have their mindsets. What, what it is that, you know, that helps him be successful, whether it's thinking to swing down or thinking knob to the ball or whatever, whatever works for you, fine. Okay. But why are we, why are so many people who had zero success in the game out there teaching kids to hit like the best players on the planet? Right. Well, what I, what I see a lot at the younger levels is I would say from you know, whatever, T-ball might be a little bit too young. But anyway, up to the age of 12, where they play on these fields that have 200-foot fences. And mommy and daddy just love when little junior hits the ball over the fence. So that, when they're very young, that sets that mindset already that I want to hit everything over the fence. Well, the reality is when you start getting up to the major league field when you're 13 years old, those are out. Those are no longer home runs over the fence. And Again, because major leagues have been teaching a launch angle, well, I think that a lot of the instructors pick up from that 12U season and want to keep teaching these boys how to hit the ball to try and hit it out, out, of, the, out of the park. Whereas I look at the game differently at the youth level. You know this better than anybody else. There's very few major leaguers. There's very few guys that can play at that level. So why don't we teach the game to the player's ability, okay, where hitting the ball in the gap, base hits, doubles, moving runners, this is the way it should be taught. But I think that people get caught up in what Major League is doing, you know, the oohs and the ahs of hitting that 12-year-old home run over a 200-foot fence, which is not realistic because those days are a very short part of your baseball, quote-unquote, career. Right, and, and I remember the first – the first season I went from the, you know, the little league size field to the 90 foot basis and 60 foot mound. You know, I remember hitting a line drive to right field and getting thrown out at first base by 20 feet. I was like, what the heck is going on? Here? That's supposed to be a base hit, you know? And, and I remember seeing kids when my, when my boys were playing little league, you know, and they had the composite bats and then the 200 foot fences. And I remember one kid hit four home runs one day, four for four, four home runs in one game. And they weren't just barely over the fence. They were bombs. And this kid didn't even make his high school team because he was swinging for the fences, you know. And, and it's sad to me that parents are buying into this stuff. The, right. the hit home runs. I mean, you know, especially these little kids that weigh 90 pounds are trying to lift the ball like Joey Gallo. Exactly. You know, no clue. And, and um, you know, I always believe in, in hitting hard line drives and, ground balls for me when i didn't hit a line drive it was better for me to hit a ground ball than a fly ball because fly balls yeah. were generally caught and I, I even in the minor leagues i would get yelled at for hitting the ball in the air yeah, yeah. i yeah. i had a i had a player last summer real quick story he got up i don't remember exactly what happened but you know whatever he got a base hit stole second and got moved over to third i'm coaching third base 
And he had his head down when he got to third base. Now, this is a 14 year old boy. He had his head down. And I said, you know, what, what's wrong? I said, you know, you're on third base, you know, we're, whatever. We're, we're getting ready to score. He goes, ah, coach. He said, I hit a ground ball. I said, you hit a ground ball. I said, you hit a screaming ground ball in the five, six hole into the left field and got a base hit. What is, I said, we'll talk later, but you know, I, I did straighten him out later, but my point is that was the mentality is, Oh, I hit the ball on the ground. What? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's wrong with that? You're on base. Who cares? Yeah. I'm, I'm coaching, I'm coaching JV right now. So um, for some of the kids I'm seeing other than maybe a little bit over the summer, this is their, their first time of moving up to the big field. And it is one of the things that we go over right in January is like, you, know, you, you don't understand those, those shots that were going 210 feet and you got a home run on. It's the easiest out in the game. Like yeah. to me, that's the easiest out in the game. You know, well, strikeouts. Well, you need at least three pitches that the person misses, you know, much less foul balls and everything else. Ground balls. It's too many, too many variables. The fly ball fielder has the most time to, to react and get to the ball. And two, there's no, you don't have to make a throw. I mean, you know, tagging up one up, but it's the easiest out in the game. And that's where these guys are trying to lift the ball and it's going 250 feet. I'm like, great. The player didn't even have to move. Right. <laughs> awesome. I, I noticed that last year, a lot in the major leagues. I mean, it's hard to watch a three hour baseball game anymore, to be honest, at the big, even at the big league level, but I'm watching these games and I never remember seeing so many weak fly balls to the outfield. It's just yeah. one after the next, after the next. And then a guy hits a homer, then a guy strikes out, and then another two weak pop ups. And it's like, yeah, you know, those you're, not, you're putting no pressure on the defense. You're not, I mean, those guys can catch a, you know, a fly ball with their eyes closed. And, and you know, it's not putting, you know, hard ha ground balls and making infielders move and putting pressure in. I mean, I know as an infielder, when I was playing professionally, uh, especially in the big leagues, is, you know, when I had Ricky Henderson on first base and Pudge Rodriguez catching and I got to cover the bag and I got, you know, Carney Lansford hitting, I know he can hit the ball the other way. I mean, that's pressure, right? <laughs> I know. Uh -huh. I mean, if I don't get over there in time to cover the um, – you know, get the throw from Pudge, he's going to be pissed at me because he wants to throw out this – the greatest base stealer in the history of the game. And Ricky, I know Ricky's going to try to go. Absolutely. To steal off a of pudge. And, you know, and I'm like, you know, why am I in this equation? These guys, are, <laughs> you know, I just, I just don't want to mess up and embarrass my family when, you know, not being in the right place or making an error. I'm like, man, that's pressure. Right. <laughs> but it's true though. So, I mean, you know, the, the small, the small ball has, been taken right out of the game and i see it at the youth levels i see it at the high school levels no longer well i shouldn't say no longer not many guys are teaching the game you know like i'll, I'll give you an example my, my first year as a high school coach i was told that listen don't worry about what happens this year because the team won three three games as a freshman team so don't worry about it do the best you can and, and don't worry we're not going to judge on this so i said all right whatever so talk to guys how to run the bases, how to bunt, how to move runners, all of the small things. Well, we were 14 and four. That's the way you play the game. Now, if I would have, if I would have taken that same approach that, Hey guys, we got to hit this ball over the fence. So we're not going to win anything. Well, you want to know something? We would have won probably three games then too. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, how many, how many home runs, how many home runs are getting hit in JV on None. a season? No, I, I think we might've seen one. We might have seen one last year, and it was, you know, a 300 pound guy who just happened to get a good windy day. Yeah. Um, that's it. Otherwise, yeah, those are outs, man. And once, once you're past eight, nine years old, those are all outs. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. So let's talk a little bit about, about your presence on social media. Cause I get, I, I know me, I get a kick out of it. So, you know, how did this, how did this evolve? How did you become the guy that, saw what was being put out there not all the time but certain people putting things out there that were just like ridiculous and started calling people out i love it well i uh i'm on a group text with three good buddies of mine um two of them are still scouting and one used to be a scout and was my old teammate in the minor leagues and so we sent each other some of these funny things we see 
these funny drills and stuff. And so one day I was in the backyard and my, my oldest son, Cannon, was out there and I said, hey, I want you to video me real fast. So I grabbed this piece of plastic from an old tee and I, I did this thing and I like, I was like, oh man, the light bulb just went on because I'd saw a video, <laughs> a video of somebody doing that. And uh, I put it on Twitter and I really was, I didn't have much of a presence on Twitter at all. I had, my friend, Billy Martin Jr. told me to get on Twitter, it's fun. So I got on there, I had like 600, I think I had, started my account like eight years ago and but never used it and so I put this video on there and this one of the scouts texts me he goes dude you have four thousand views on that video and I was like <laughs> seriously and he's like yes and I was like oh my god and uh I didn't really didn't think anything of it I go to bed about to go to bed and I look at my Twitter direct message and man I got all these messages from people you're a piece of, you know what, Fry, and your son's this, and things I can't say what they called my sons. Oh, and uh, I was like, I went to bed. I was like, what did I do? I don't even know what I did here. And, uh, well, I woke up the next day determined. I was pissed. Um, I had some back and forth with these guys. And I was like, well, guess I need to make another video. And so I made another video. And that one, I don't even know what it has now. At one point, I had over 100,000 views. And I was imitating the teacher man, Lil Richie, <laughs> my favorite guy, one of my favorite guys, you know, who, who learned how to hit uh, watching videos of Barry Bonds in his basement. Um, <laughs> so I put this video on there and man, it, at the end of this video, I hit the ball and I said, she gone like that, just accident. I mean, I had no idea what I was doing. I was a big fan of the White Sox announcers went during my career, Hawk and Wimpy. I thought they made the game fun to listen to by saying some of the things. He's like, grab some bench or he goes, silly stuff like that, that other announcers didn't say. And so I came, I just said, she gone like that. And one of my friends goes on Twitter, not, I think it was at not Guy Eddie, who I actually thought was Gary Guy Eddie, um, but it's not Guy Eddie. His name's Frank <laughs> Jolene, who's a composer in New York, good buddy now goes, you should hashtag she gone. And I was like, okay, what does that mean? Right. And so I did it and I hashtag she gone. And then next thing I know, now I'm selling she gone t-shirts. You see, I'm wearing right here. I got a <laughs> website selling t-shirts and hats and all this stuff and started, got a brand she gone and um, all by accident. So that's that's pretty amazing because, well, I mean, let's 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 put that in, into what Dave and I talk about all the time with youth baseball, because I always tell people go out there on the Internet. There's there's tons of stuff to look at. And I mean, between the USA baseball stuff and, you know, different videos and different YouTube channels, there's a lot of good stuff that coaches can learn from so that they can help young players get better. But there's also stuff out there that is not good for people to look at. So I think what you're doing, which I think is a, is a great service to people, is kind of pointing a finger at, you know, hey, listen, this may not be what you want to teach your kids. So I, I think, it, you know, you, you provide a, a valuable, we'll call it a valuable service to people to understand, hey, it's not what we do. Well, I think if, it, if you see the PVC pipe, you should probably not do that. <laughs> That's one of the <laughs> one of the, uh, the gadgets. I don't know if you guys have seen my bucket in my backyard. It's got all these silly gadgets in it. Yes, that, uh, I've seen it. Uh, I've seen videos. The recycling where bin. They have uh, the orange cones, you know, that you see on the roads and stuff. They use the cone as a hitting tool. I've seen fishing <laughs> nets. Um, uh, ch the Chuck It dog toy. Um, you know, and I, you know, I made up a few of them on my own, the, the plunger, don't spill the poop out of the plunger. Uh, that's a little Richie, you know? <laughs> a little Richie, one, you know, Richie's snap it thing where oh, the, God. every every hitter, the first thing you do is snap your barrel back to create barrel depth and launch quickness so you can release the torsion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, would believe that, you know, that this pool hall owner, who every time he takes a swing almost falls over uh, <laughs> is, is, you know, the most knowledgeable hitting expert. And we actually did a, a show in Chicago, the showdown. 
And he told a whole audience filled with people who work in Major League Baseball that they don't know what he knows. And then he and goes, booyah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's, that's baseball's better for it. Oh, my God. They don't know what he knows. Yeah. So apparently so he's he, been doing this for 30 years on on uh, social media, just wow. ripping people until they finally get pissed and go away because him and his minions attack you, which is what they tried to do to me when I posted that first video. It was all the people that uh, he says are the only people that teach the right way to hit when he when he was asked at john malley's clinic in chicago who would you say are the the, the people on social media that teach have good uh teach good hitting techniques he goes only the people that i've trained and teach oh my God. those are the only people in the world who teach uh who have um, you know, any credibility and teach the right way to hitters only him and the five or six people that he taught the HLP snap it style. Those are the only ones. The rest of us, we don't know anything. Right. The HLP, I actually had to look it up, find out what it meant. And I believe it or not, I looked it up. I found out what it meant. And then I forgot about it. Maybe 10 minutes later, I still don't know what it means. Yeah. The high level pattern. Okay. All right. Because I, I just, I don't, I don't see it with all of that snapping. I mean, I don't know. I, I'm, if you don't see it. If you don't see it, Richie can't help you. That's what he said. That's what he said. So I'm like looking at, at something that he says is happening in a swing, and I'm like, man, I don't see that. How does how does he see this stuff? And and what he tells people, you're basically stupid if you don't see what he sees, and if you don't see it, then he can't help you. Yeah, it's wow. it's it's funny. From the time where I started coaching uh, 14 years ago, something like that, it seemed like there was a there was just a, a kind of the infancy of YouTube and, and things like that, where there was a lot of good stuff out there. And now I go on and I mean, trying to weed through the stuff that is no good is just, it, it could be a full-time job. So, I mean, I, I appreciate anybody who tells it like it tells it like it is because it's, you know, there, there's a situation where we say, well, you know, well, that's his opinion, his opinion's just as valid as my opinion, whatever. And for me, I think that's true for somebody who played in the big leagues and who does this all day long. That's not true. You have a much more valid, you know, everybody has a right to their opinion. Well, but some of us have much better, bigger rights than others. And I, I firmly, firmly believe in that. And um, if we don't speak up, if we don't have people like you that are pointing these things out, you just look at, well, how many people might stumble across this video of this tool and spend $180 on something that's like, it's going to wind up in the, in the garbage can in, in three weeks or, or a month or whatever. So I personally, I appreciate that tremendously. Well, thank you. And it's uh, I have some of those tools in my garage. And that's what they're doing. The rebels rack is one of them. The arm blaster you stick under here. It helps you turn your body. And um, there's a lot of nonsense. And that's my main focus is to educate parents that I believe are wasting money and hurting their kids. Their kids are getting the wrong instruction and their kids are going to have, are going to fail um, because they're trying to do things that they shouldn't be trying to do. And it's not going to be fun to them and they're going to quit. And, and that's, you know, that's one of the things um, my friend, Kevin Gallagher sent me his book, teach your kid to hit so they don't quit. And I read it and I was like, this is genius. And that's like, you know, basically it teaches parents how to teach their kid how to hit, that they don't have to pay, spend 80 bucks on an hour lesson with some guy who played one fall in Juco and was no good, you know, that now is a hitting expert at the local hitting, you know, at the local hitting facility <laughs> and, you know, go in the backyard with your kid, you know, get a wiffle ball bat and a wiffle ball or whatever and, and read Kevin's book and it teaches you the parents how to work with their kids and you know what? you're in the backyard with your kids, right? You're, you're getting good time with your kids. You're bonding. Right. And, and, you know, if your kid loves it, he's going to want to do it the next day. And if he doesn't like it, let him go do what he likes to do. And, and, and so much time is wasted. I believe on these lessons where parents are just driving their kids and dumping them off and leaving and come back an hour later. And the kids after a while, don't even want to go. It's like, it's right. not, they're not looking forward to going to these lessons. 
You know, there's right. mom and daddy are trying to turn little Jimmy into a big leaguer someday, or maybe get a D1 scholarship so they can post it on social media. Right. Well, I mean, I can tell you because I do instruct players and I do give lessons on hitting, but believe it or not, most of the time I spend teaching, most of the time I'm teaching them about their approach and, you know, how are we dealing with different speeds? Because I, I, I believe that you, you got to keep it simple. There's a few things that you should be doing. You know, your, your hips have to initiate the swing. You know, um, one of the things that we talk about that, that I think I've heard you say before, because it's a big cue for me, is staying on top of the ball. Because your hands start out, you know, by your ear, by your shoulder. Okay. And, you know, a, a, a fastball that you want to hit is belt high. So how are we going to get our hands underneath the ball? It's impossible. You're going to have to, I don't drop your shoulder, drop everything. I, I don't see it. Drop your hands. So anyway, my point is keep it simple. An athlete will do what an athlete does and have to find out what works for him. There are certain things that we could help him with. I don't want to overcomplicate anything, but I think that a, a lot of it has to do with his approach. How is he approaching? If he has two strikes on him, what is he thinking? What is he looking for? that type of thing where I think a lot of instructors trying to impress you with what they know and they're throwing all this crap at these kids and these kids can't handle it all. You know, one thing at a time, I'll teach you one thing. And when we get that, then we'll move on. Mm -hmm. It's the big word. I like to use the big words too, and to try and sound smart, you know, and it's people ask me all the time. It's like, well, what do you teach kids? I was like, I don't know. I have to see them hit before I know what I'm going to teach them. I'm exactly. not going to teach them all the same thing. I mean, I know what worked for me and it, you know, it got me to play at the highest level of the game. Doesn't mean it will work for your kid, but I can t teach him what, what, you know, the techniques and that I used and, you know, the whole idea about this, I agree with you hundred percent on getting on top of the ball is what I always thought. And, you know, the whole feel versus real argument is that, yeah, he thought he was on top of the ball, but look at his swing. He's actually not. Well, you know what? That, thinking that way helped me um, get the barrel of the bat to the ball. Who cares yes. what happened back here? Okay. That's right. You can slow down the video and look at it, try and teach people to do this. And, you know, this whole idea of barrel depth. Okay. Never heard of barrel depth till like no. two years ago. It's like, that sounds like a long swing to me. What does it matter what I'm doing back here? I don't want this. It, this is going to take longer for my bat to get to the hitting zone than from right here to right here. Okay, I'm not chopping down a tree. My key is hands right here, right to the ball, and then stay through the zone and finish high and try and hit the middle of the baseball on the line. Keep the KISS method, just like you said, Jimmy. Keep it simple, stupid, and don't overcomplicate it. And, and that's just what I, you know, what I learned. And you're right about the approach. My approach varied from at bat to at bat, from pitch to pitch. Pitch to pitch, sure. But I knew, I knew what my plan was, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time before I stepped in that batter's box, I had a plan. Right. You know, and I would look at where the guys were playing me, know the situation of the game, know what was being asked of me in that situation, even without somebody actually asking me. I knew right. when I came up to sec, when I came up, the type of hitter that I was, um, a sit, you know, a runner on second, no outs. I knew what my job was. My job is to move him to third at the least at, in the worst case scenario, we got a runner on third, one out. Right. Now I wasn't necessarily trying to give myself up, but I was trying to drive the ball hard the other way to move him to third, to set up my teammate who's coming up behind me because I knew it was a lot easier for, the guys to hit behind me to knock this guy in from third with one out then second, yeah. you know? So that, that's what I did. And it just buried, you know, like I said, at bat to at bat and pitch to pitch. Well, I can tell you that, that, that approach where you just said, you know, run around second base, no outs. If you play for me and you get up there, you swing out of your shoes on that pitch to try and, you know, make yourself look like a hero and you don't do what you need to do to move that runner. You're going right on the bench. After that at bat, you're sitting down and you're going to think about that for a few innings before we go back out there. But, you know, again, I, I think that I'm, I'm a dinosaur. I don't think a lot of guys look at it that way. We're boomers. We're boomers. That's what I hear. 
scream at the clouds. We don't know. That's the old way they used to play. And now that's better off if you just go up there and try and hit the ball hard in the air. Good things will happen as long as you don't change your approach. And that, I think that's the problem with the product we see at the major league level is that guys are being told not to shorten up with two strikes. Don't put the ball in play. As long as you keep your normal swing and try and drive that ball um, in the long run, we're going to be more successful. And I think it's a bunch of nonsense. One other thing real quick, if we're indoors and we're hitting in a cage and you hit the top of the cage, you're out of the cage. That's it. Mm -hmm. Next guy. We're trying to hit backspin line drives to the back of the cage. Yep. And that's it. That's the way we work out. All right. So, so you brought up um, friend of the show, former guest, Kevin Gallagher, his book, teach your kids to hit so they don't quit. And again, we're big fans of it here. We recommend it all the time. Anybody that's got youth players uh, get out there, read the book, read it with them, show them what's in there and get out in the backyard and, and do it. You'd be amazed at what types of progress you can make very quickly. So I know you're also very involved with the program. Save the game is the is the website. I know that this is about the time we it, it's been a couple months since we talked to Kevin here on the show. I know this was about the time you guys were hoping to be really up, have the website up and running. We've recommended to everybody to go out and sign up so that we hear about it. How are things shaping up with that? No, it's good. It's uh, it's moving along. We have hired a publicist who's really helping us um, get the word out there. A lot of the big name writers, baseball writers, are writing stories about it. Uh, Kevin Kiernan is writing about it. Uh, Nightingale's writing about it, and I think we're the word's getting out there. It's not going to be easy, honestly, because. Uh, you know, trying to get people to go online and take the time out of their day to sign a petition seems like it's, it's too much to ask for some people. <laughs> but if you love our national past, if you love our national pastime and you really uh, are concerned about where it is today and like we are uh, and we love baseball, and we can hardly watch it. Please come sign, sign the petition. You know, we're trying to improve the game and get back to you know, the way that uh, they used to play the game where there's more action and it's more entertaining. And right now, I can tell you that not just me, but a lot of my old teammates and guys I played against at the highest level of the sport can't watch a baseball game. And that should yeah. be concerning to people. Yeah, I know. I know I'm, I'm in that pool. I cannot watch a baseball game anymore. I'd rather watch a college game or... Matter of fact, I think it was yesterday I was watching a rerun of a game from, I don't know, maybe the 1990s. And, you know, you, could, you, you see it's a dramatic difference. It's dramatic. As a matter of fact, the game I was watching, I forgot Oakland was playing somebody. It was a, a playoff game. And they won the game on a suicide squeeze in the bottom of the ninth. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, I don't care how many home runs you hit. There's nothing more exciting than that. Yeah. You know what's funny is I, I – I was talking to one of my buddies the other day and he said he was watching a rerun of some game. And I was like, I was watching a, a baseball game a couple of days ago. It's like, I went to a restaurant and they had like a Rangers game on and Nolan Ryan was pitching against the blue Jays. And it's like, I couldn't take my eyes off the television. This game is 30 years old yeah. and I can't stop watching it. But if there's a game today on TV, I wouldn't even pay attention. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's background noise. Most, most of the time yeah. it's, it's on, but you're not watching. watching. Yeah. I've been seeing some of this, like when the Seattle Mariners, Seattle Mariners uh, made the playoffs and they beat the Yankees and Edgar hit the double and Ken Griffey Jr. Scored from first base and people in Seattle, you know, they say it saved baseball in Seattle. And I'm just like watching this game going, man, I remember when that happened, you yeah. know, it was like so cool. And now it's like, Oh, let's watch the Rangers and the, you know, the Oakland A's game on a Wednesday afternoon. I was like, I'm not watching this. <laughs> There's some golf on or something, <laughs> you know, it's just right. not entertaining anymore. Right. And, so and the, the, the lock with the lockout now too, right? I don't think that, I mean, somebody has got to wake them up to make them understand that you're losing, you know, what, whatever you have. And now you have billionaires fighting with millionaires over a nonsense and you're losing more people. I, I'm, I really believe that they're going to have a hard time uh, coming back from this. 
Yeah, we don't have Sammy Sosa and Mark McGuire to us <laughs> this time. <laughs> you know? And I think it's it's man, we're it's it's a really scary situation for baseball people because I don't know that we can get the fans back this time. Look what's going on in our world, you know, especially what's going on in Europe right now. We've had two years of pandemic. Um, you know, our the total landscape of our world has changed in the last yeah. two years, you know, uh, and not for better, obviously. And, you know, now's the time where baseball, which after 9-11, baseball man it just like brought us together right remember when george bush threw out that first pitch and it was like right. you know you're just never more proud to be an american right, right. And, and baseball has that power to to bring people together and all we're doing right now is just tearing everybody apart and it's like man you guys got to be smarter than this because after what just we just saw in the last you know, the end of the football season with the incredible playoffs. I mean, you know, every game, every day was incredible. You know, these, and it's like, man, no wonder football is the most popular sport in America because I've sat here and watched for seven hours today and couldn't get off my couch. And um, now we have an opportunity in baseball since football's over to get back out there and get people excited. And man, I hope they don't mess this up. Well, yeah, it's not looking promising right now. There's a deadline for Monday in order for this, the season to start on time. And that's looking like less and less. And like Jimmy said, when well, both, both you guys saying, I just, I like the term, the way Jimmy said it, it was the, you know, the millionaires and the billionaires are arguing about stuff that common people, us, us common folk can't even get a grasp of, you know, why, you know, what difference does, 18 million versus 17 and a half million make to, to something or billion dollars or, or whatever. And, you know, you look at, like you said, without wanting to be a, a big downer, what's going on in the world, who's going to care about, who's going to care about that. And, and, and you know, it, it, there was, there was times when there's been, you know, whether it be baseball, basketball, football, when there was a lockout or there was a strike or whatever, and there was definitive lines of fans that were on this side or that side. I haven't heard anything of that. I, I there's not a side to pick on this. The, you know? the, the other thing, the other thing too, is that, you know, sports is supposed to be something that gets our mind away from all of this stuff, the pandemic, what's going on in Europe. It's supposed to be an escape for, right. for the average fan. And if you're not seeing, you know, if the, if the people in major league baseball are not seeing that and understanding it, then I don't know, man, then they're headed down a, a, a bad road. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm sure you guys have seen, I'm not a big fan of the commissioner. Um, you know, I think he, I don't know what he's done. Has he done anything good since he's been commissioner? One thing I really not haven't seen opinion. it. And I um, love Tony Clark. Um, got to meet Tony when I um, went to spring training with the Tigers and played against him and the union meetings and things. And, um, you know, I, I don't know if, if the players that are, you know, on the committees are the right players. I don't know. They're, they're all the super, super, super rich guys. Right. right. Yeah. They are, they worried about the, are they worried about the rookies? Uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know. There's, they should be, maybe they are. And I don't want to say they're not, but um, you know, it's the guys like me that, you know, that didn't make the big bucks that, you know, trying to maximize your earnings in the, the few years you have, those are the guys that are, shaking in their boots right now it's not the guys who made 30 million last year driving you see garrett cole pull up to the the meetings and his convertible and get out looking like a you know like a versace model it's like yeah he's yeah he's worried about gas prices going up right yeah, <laughs> yeah right is he worried about the the, the single a kid you yeah. know that's that, that's just hanging on and what a shame i, I forever I'm ashamed that the Major League Baseball Players Association hasn't embraced the minor leaguers. I think that's a travesty. These poor guys, um, you know, they should have a union, you know, and it's like they're, they're not part of us until they are. And then once they are, then, oh, yeah, you guys are part of our union now. But 
when you're a lowly minor leaguer, we don't give two craps about you. And I think that's terrible. Um, yeah. I think that that needs to change. Right. A little bit of support would be nice. Yeah. So let's uh, let's switch directions. Let's talk about something uh, a little more positive here. Let's talk about. Uh, I know you're involved in this new uh, venture that you have. Uh, your brand ambassador for Rotor Systems USA. Uh, why don't you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. I've been uh, doing some things with Rotor System USA for three or four months now. I went to the ABCA in Chicago. Went to the Texas High School Baseball Coaches uh, Association convention in Grapevine, Texas. And Rotor Systems USA is uh, owned by Paulo De Prima uh, from Italy, and uh, make baseball product for making batting tees, a rotor system to teach kids to use their lower half, and also a bat rack. At this point, probably make some other products in the future. But what's really cool about these products is that they're made in a factory in Italy by Paulo's father. He's had his wow. same factory in Italy for 60 years, so third and fourth generations of families that are working for him. And he makes these tees. He's a mechanical engineer. He designs his stuff on a pad, uh, pad and paper and a pencil. And um, he's designed all these things. And he has these machines that... Uh, you know, use a composite plastic material to make these products and we can make up to a thousand batting tees a day. Wow. And it's, it's pretty incredible. And it's from Italy. Italy's known for their craftsmanship. Um, you know, when you see the sign that something's made in Italy, you immediately think it's going to be a high quality, right? And it's sure. not, and it's not from China which is another bonus, <laughs> right? Especially with all the, especially with all the problems we're having in uh, shipping and things like that. Um, we're not going to have problems getting our, our products over here and are going to be high quality products that um, I think are going to be huge on the market. And we're going to hopefully be in all the, the stores, Walmart, Target, Academy, Dick, Sam's. Um, so check it out. Rotor system USA dot com i'm the brand ambassador and i think our teas are are going to be um, you know the best teas on the market i'm not just saying that because um i'm an ambassador i wouldn't be endorsing these products if i didn't believe in them hey well you're known as being the straight shooter right so if you're saying it i gotta i gotta believe it and these the the one of the main differences with these is this is also something that this is not just for coaches. This is for the individual. It's something that's easy, easily portable um, for somebody to take. A kid can throw it in their existing bat bag and, and whatever and, and can have it with them, right? Yeah. And actually, if you go to check out the website, you can see um, there was a, we, we filmed the videos at my friend's batting cage in, in Prosper, Texas. And there was just a young boy there that happened to walk in. And I said, hey, you want to make a video? And he came over there and, uh, and he used a rotor system. And he also, uh, we took the tea apart. The tea comes in three pieces. It takes about 10 seconds to take apart. Uh, he put it in his backpack bag, which is even smaller than a regular, you know, uh, equipment bag. He put his backpack bag, zipped it up, walked in the cage, took it out, put it together in five to 10 seconds and uh, started hitting, you know, so you see, most of the times, uh, a little league coach might, I never even hardly brought a batting tee to practice, to be honest, um, but a lot of coaches will bring a batting tee um, to practice. Well, that takes one arm to carry. Okay, it could be because yeah. it really does. It's not like you can carry anything else in that hand um, when you have mm -hmm. a batting tee that you're carrying. So you only have one other hand to carry your balls and your bats and your book that you're going to, you know, you have your, your schedule planned out for the day or whatever else, your waters, whatever. You got one hand dedicated to carrying this stupid tea, <laughs> right? It weighs five pounds. Well, this tea comes apart. You stick it in your bag. You, you know, if you want three or four of them, you can put them in an equipment bag, put them all together in 10 seconds. And instead of sitting around wasting time, the kids are practicing. So mom drops off Jimmy 15 minutes early to practice because she has to be at her yoga um, from five to six and coach right. doesn't get there in time what do kids do when they get to practice they sit on the Stand bench around. with their phone their snapchat they don't do anything right they don't have anything to practice they're there by themselves maybe 
you know, they throw a couple balls in their bag and the batting tee in their bag. They take it out and start practicing instead of wasting 15 minutes on their cell phones. Yeah. And we do a lot of, or I should say, I incorporate a lot of tee work in my practices. So with these tees, roughly, how much do they, do they cost? Uh, the top of the line tee will be $119. Uh, we're making uh, another tee that's a little more lightweight. That will be $79. I mean, down the road, we might make even a, a lesser, less expensive tea. But it's high. if you look at the tea, teas on the market, they're all around those same price range. And they break a lot easier. I mean, you can run over our tea with a, with a truck, and it's not going to break this composite material. Huh? Yeah, because I, awesome. I can tell you, I, I never have enough teas. What I try and do is instead of having coaches hitting fungos a lot of times, especially with the younger guys, I'll set up tees. So in other words, if we're hitting, hitting to our outfielders, I'll set up a tee station where there's guys that are hitting off the tee to the outfielders rather than have a coach hitting fungo. And we'll do the same thing with infield. If we're hitting ground balls, I'll set up several tees where guys are hitting off the tee. So kind of killing two birds with one stone. Wow, I've never seen that done. That's a great <laughs> idea. I mean, I, I swear the light bulb just went on. Uh, <laughs> that Actually, you can have kids, um, hitting off the tee ground balls or fly balls to that's really a great idea yeah i'll yeah, even we'll, do i'll even do it with base running where i'll set up a bow net right in front of home plate so i'll have runners at first second and third base taking the right leads a kid hitting into that net from home plate and you know that they'll they'll take their lead you know I'll, I'll shout out a certain situation they'll take their lead and as soon as they make contact then the guys take off to the next base and we rotate around that way so again wow. we're killing a few birds with one stone it seems like you're killing a lot of birds with a couple stones that's a great <laughs> idea well, you got yeah, all, all about keeping the kids active and moving we, we all know one of the problems with with the game as we talk about is is especially at practice what's the the traditional practice batting practice one kid's up you got 11 kids standing around so we're always looking for different ways to keep more the more active kids can be during the say at the same time and still work on the fundamentals uh, and getting better obviously it's 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 all win-win yeah especially when you have that field for an hour you know you yeah. gotta you gotta get it in and you know that used to be the way we did it is you know all right batting practice three guys in you know, you know, Little League, actually, it's like two guys in, the guy who's hitting, and then the guy who's on deck, and then yep. everybody else just standing around doing nothing. <laughs> yep. Yep. So that's, all right, so so that's rotorsystemusa.com. You can go out and check out the, the new tees that they have out there, rotorsystemusa.com. And just want to remind everybody, so we're on with Jeff Fry, former major leaguer, current uh, ambassador for rotor systems. He's involved in the save the game us.com program with Kevin Gallagher. Uh, we want to recommend everybody get out there, um, go to the website, sign up. It just takes a minute. Jimmy and I have done it months ago, uh, waiting for the next big step to come out on that. And uh, did you have anything else, Jeff, any other topics that you want to get into today? Yeah. So, uh, Earlier, we were talking about uh, my size being something that I had to overcome. And I told the story about when in ninth grade, I went out for basketball at Bishop O'Dowd and coach Mike Phelps had told me to come back when I grew up. So I never forgot that. And that, you know, that inspired me to practice on my basketball skills. And, um, you know, was fortunate enough to go to Juco to play basketball. I didn't play that much in college, uh, realized baseball was probably going to be my ticket but the cool ending to that story was in 1992 I got called up to the big leagues of the Texas Rangers and spent the rest of the season I think I got called up like July 8th or June 8th I don't really remember um, exactly I know my mom remembers the day <laughs> but uh, we went to Oakland California to play the Oakland A's and uh, you know I had like 30 people from my family and friends and stuff at the game, the Oakland Coliseum. And in the ninth inning, I'm facing Dennis Eckersley. Dennis Eckersley was Cy Young and MVP this year, 1992. And runners on first and second, Toby Hera, who was our interim manager, he, got, he replaced Bobby Valentine um, and they fired Bobby Valentine the same day I got called up. 
Um, don't think he got fired because he called me up, but it's a possibility. <laughs> worst, <laughs> worst decision I've ever seen. Yeah, they called up Jeff Fry, get rid of this bum. Um, <laughs> and so first and second, I think it was a 1-0 count. Toby puts on a hit and run, which you don't see a lot of hit and runs with first and second, um, especially I'm facing friggin' Dennis Eckersley. And so the first pitch I fouled off. So now it's one and one count. He puts on a hit and run again, the next Jeez. pitch. And then we're in the ninth inning, the tie game. And he puts on a hit and run. Eckersley throws me a slider and I hit a freaking bullet line drive to left field for a base hit to knock in a run. And we go up four to three. We end up winning the game four to three. Um, you know, I got the game winning RBI that used to keep track of those things. Um, you know, I was, I was pretty, <laughs> now I was pumped. You know, I got all my family there, just not, you know, in my hometown where I was born, just beat the Oakland A's and Dennis Eckersley. And it's like, wow, that's pretty cool. So, you know, none of the reporters even came up to me after the game. I'm like, are you guys not watching the game? Did you see what just happened? Right. And so I actually called a reporter over Oakland Chronicle. I don't remember his name. And I said, hey, will you please do me a favor? I said, I want you to tell my high school basketball coach, Mike Phelps from Bishop O'Dowd High School, that Jeff Fry is back and he's grown up now. That's awesome. And it was in the paper the next day. My home, I mean, it was like, yeah. Did, yeah, keep Did your phone me, ring? That you told me to come back when I grew up, coach, and I'm back. I want to let you know that. It, it, so your phone didn't ring. He didn't call no, you. No, I never talked to him again after I left school. <laughs> well, he's only there for one year. And he was our baseball coach too. And my math teacher. Um, but I never had communicated with him ever again when I left school. You know, it, it's, it's amazing. The, the things that drive us and the things that provide motivate motivation to us, it, it comes from odd sources sometimes. And that's, you know, it's, it's being able to take that adversity and turn it into a positive that, you know, that's, 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 that's a fantastic story. Yeah. yeah. yeah I don't think he knew he was inspiring me. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> I was cut from the basketball team, but he uh, inadvertently inspired me to prove him wrong. So. Hey, well, good on you for, uh, for taking that next step, man. Uh, and just like all, all the stories you've heard today, you know, again, Jeff Fry, former major leaguer, realest guy in the room. And, and I, I certainly appreciate it. Jimmy appreciates the way that, uh, you know, you don't hold back. If somebody's doing something that's not positive and it's not good for the kids, you're going to let them know. And I don't, I don't know if there's enough of that out there in the world right now, because it should all be focused on development, uh, you know, developing these kids in the right way. So they can not just hit a home run today on a 200 foot field, but stay with the game and play it for the next, whatever, 10, 20, 30 years, whether it be at the college level or just rec ball. Uh, if we're not developing the love of the game with these kids by teaching them the right way to do it, we are doing a major disservice. I agree. And, and you know, one thing I, I haven't mentioned uh, throughout this podcast is the very, the most important thing in my mind um, in youth sports is it's supposed to be fun for these kids. Okay. Because the odds are they're not going to play even in college. And if they get lucky to play in college and get a chance to someday play professionally, the odds are so small let's just let them be kids and have fun and enjoy themselves. And if they have the ability and they have the work ethic and want to do it, they'll do it, but we're not going to make them do it. Let them do It's their lives. Who are we to tell them what they're supposed to do with their lives? Yeah. We, we preach it all the time, Jeff, on this show. That's all we talk about is make it fun because like you said, uh, one of our very first shows, we ran through the numbers about how many kids, actually make their high school team forget about going beyond that to make your high again a lot of people kind of take it for granted but you make your high school team that's an accomplishment because yeah. not many kids do so yes it has to be made fun so that they're enjoying themselves and they have the memories that they look back on and and that's that's what it is yeah yeah all right well, this has been uh, an awesome conversation with Jeff Fry. I want to uh, thank you, Jeff, for taking the time to come out and speak with us today and let everybody know they can get in touch with you. We're 
on Twitter is at O3JFry, and that's O as in the letter, not the number, O3JFry on Twitter. Um, he's got his website, shegonhitting.com. Reach out to him there. Uh, he loves to interact with people. You've got a video that you think something doesn't seem quite right, forward it over to him. He will give you his opinion on it. Absolutely. So I, I really, really enjoyed this. This has been a breath of fresh air to me to have this type of conversation. I want to thank you for coming on. Yeah. Thank you, David. It's nice to meet you. And thank you, Jimmy. No, Jeff, the uh, privilege was all ours. Oh. Yeah, I'm just a normal guy, man. I'm just a normal guy who had a really cool job for a while and was pretty fortunate. And, um, you know, I'm still playing in 55-year-old baseball league. I played last year for the first time. Nice. My goal is to not get injured. I don't, awesome. I don't think I could, br- I, I don't think I could bring myself to get out there anymore, but then again, I'm 59 and the wheels are starting to fall off. <laughs> My wheels are off, but I did hit over 500 last year and didn't strike out one time. And I think I was 19 for 33 nice. wow. the and didn't strike out, which, which was my goal. Nice. Wow. That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. All right. We, uh, we look forward to everything that you got going on in the future and uh, hopefully we'll get you back on at some point. Okay, guys, I appreciate it. You guys, uh, thank you for having me on and good luck with the uh, good luck with these coaching these kids up. Thanks. <laughs> I think we're going to need it. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it. A fantastic conversation with major leaguer Jeff Fry. Uh, you know, he's been through a, a heck of a lot in his career and his new ventures that he's doing now. And I think it was great to opportunity to have him on to talk with us. Yeah, I agree, Dave. And the thing that 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 really impresses me, and you know, it's it's among several you know major league players that I've talked to. Their their focus always seems to be on the younger guys, and I think Jeff's heart is really in teaching the younger guys how to play the game and play the game the right way. Yeah, when we talk about the right way, you know, I, I just I want to talk about a couple other things we didn't get into on the sh- uh, when when we had him on live. Uh, but a couple of things that he's done in his career. First off, we talk about the size. The guy is 5'9 on his best day. He's 160 pounds, but he still was able to play in the major leagues for you know eight years. That that's an amazing accomplishment. He he downplayed it when we talked to him, but he had to have be battling against that his whole his whole life basically, um, and and he was able to make a great, great career out of it. A couple of things people aren't going to necessarily know about him. You know, he was drafted by the Rangers. He was a late round draft pick. He did make it up to the show with them. He had he had a good performance. He did ultimately get cut by them the next year. He had his best season ever where he hit over 300 when he was picked up by the Red Sox. So, you know, you talk about going after uh, adversity, spurring you on and turn, turning you into a machine and turning you into a monster there. He could have just wallowed in it and whatnot, but he turned it around and he wound up having a great career. He had two major, major injuries during his career that knocked him out. One was for an entire season. Another one was for almost an entire season. He came back and it, he hit for the cycle. How many players can you name that have done that? He hit for the cycle for the Blue Jays um, towards the latter end of his career. And, it, you know, so, you know, we, we've had some great guests on that have done some amazing things with their career. But if you don't think you can learn something from a guy like Jeff Fry, man, then you're, you're right. And you mentioned that he hit for the cycle. He did that in a nine hole, by the way. Right. Right. He was, uh, you know, he, he was never, he was never the, the main attraction, but he's one of those guys you'd want on your team every, every game, every day. Yeah, I, I agree. Again, great conversation, great interview. Um, you know, I, I, I would just say to people out there, you know, listen to what Jeff has to say, say his heart is in the right place and, you know, you be the judge. Yeah, he he's you know he he's harsh on his some of his things. You know, definitely encourage you to go out there, check him out on Facebook. Just look up Jeff Fry, F R Y E, Jeff Fry on Facebook. His Twitter handle is at O three J Fry O three J F R Y, and um and that O is the letter O, not the not not a zero. Make sure you put it in correctly. <laughs> uh, you'll see. You know, he he does a lot of critical reviews of some of the stuff out there. Cause as we said, it's, it's unregulated and uh, there's, there's a lot of good, but there's a lot of bad out there. So if I'm listening to, to anybody, it's him uh, when it comes to whether, whether something looks like it makes sense or not. So 
want you to check him out as well. In addition to Facebook and Twitter, he's got his uh, website, his own website is she gone hitting, she gone hitting.com. Check him out there. And then his uh, new pro uh, product that he's working with rotor system USA that's rotor R O T O R system USA.com. Uh, it's the set of T's that he's working with. It looks like a great product. I haven't had an opportunity to use it myself at this point, but looking forward to that. Look them up, follow them. And then same thing with our show. You know, we appreciate you guys as well. Your our listeners, we keep moving up the charts. Make sure you subscribe to the show and whatever source that you're on, Spotify, Apple, what have you. Um, subscribe to the show. Give us a review. It helps push us up the charts. It helps our message get out there. Reach out to us on Twitter at, at the CTB show. Uh, you can follow either one of us on Facebook or the show itself is uh, clearing the bases on Facebook. We've got our own page there. Jump in, follow us, reach out to us, let us know what you're thinking. You have any guests that you want to hear us get on? We still got a list of people that we're working through, people trying to get on. We're gonna we're gonna get to you. Um, but you know, fortunately for us, we've got we've got a lot of interest and we we want it to keep going. Yeah, I agree, Dave. And um, you know, the show has been doing great. We're getting more and more guests, more and more interest. Um, just let's let's keep this rolling. All right. And remember, there's only two things in life that we can control at all times. That's our effort and our attitude. 100% effort at all times. Positive mental attitude, PMA. Great things will follow. Final thoughts, coach? So, yeah, Dave and I preach all of the time about using the Internet to your advantage to go out there and get that information to put you in a better position to help your players. And I think that Jeff provides, we'll call it a service that that will help you to distinguish between what is good and what is bad. I'm not saying that he's going to be the end all, but most of the stuff that he's putting out there is really good stuff and it warrants your attention. So always remember, and I think that Jeff pretty much puts this out there and, and, and reinforces this. Always remember, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Thanks again, everyone, and we'll see you on the next one.